Okay, great. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, if you've been tuning in so far, you hopefully have had a, a couple of whiskeys by now. Um, if you've just joined us for this session, um, we would recommend heartily that you pour a, a measure of Yorkshire Day 2021. Uh, which I'm going to pour for you right now. I've already got mine. Oh, I might as well do my own. Oh, you can do your own. Do Lovely. Own, yeah. Very good. <laughs> um, so this session, uh, we have David Thompson, Managing Director of Spirit Yorkshire Distillery and co-founder. And you have me, Joe Clark, Whiskey Director. And we're going to be talking to you about these things. Wood. You got it. Yeah. Casks, wood, oak. What's it all about? What does it do for flavour? What does it do for colour and all, all, all parts of it, really, all parts of the process. Um, you know, you can't make whiskey without good casks. That's a given. Um, casks come in all different shapes and sizes and from all corners of the world. Um, and they've all held different things and different producers use them in different ways. Um, so there's a few really crucial parts before we look at the types of casks and before we look at how they interplay uh, with our whiskey and how we use them. Um, first thing you've got to do is find them. <laughs> you've got to find the right ones, um, which uh, I'm sure takes you back to some cracking visits, Dave, if you want to share. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's I, Jim Swan, who was, was our sort of mentor, as you probably know if you've been following the distillery. And, um, you know, he had some very uh, important uh, sort of ideas of how to go about selecting your cast, but, but fundamentally it was un underlined by the fact you had to get quality. You know, there's no point in putting a distillery in, uh, you know, growing all your own crop and, and doing everything in the process and then putting it into poor wood because poor wood will never make uh, anything. It won't make a great whiskey. So the wood element, if you like, is, is incredibly important. You know, if you're spending all that time up front making a great spirit, you know, you've got to have great wood. Um, so really, you know, the question from Jim at that time was, what do you want to make? You know, what sort of style of, of, uh, of liquid you want to make and, and what sort of, you know, wood do you want to use? Um, and it came down to the fact that really we wanted something really easy going, really light fruity. So to get that, you need a, an ex-bourbon cask. So fundamentally, everything um, that we put our spirit into, pretty much everything we put our spirit into, it, it has something before. So um, it's either been filled with bourbon, um, and as we all know, um, or we maybe don't know, but bourbon can only go into new oak. So there's an abundance of second uh, use bourbon cask kicking about. We call those first fill in the industry, which is quite confusing. It is a little bit confusing, <laughs> to be fair. But um, yeah, so you've got to, the most important thing is you have to build a relationship with the suppliers, right? So it's no point in um, swapping around and changing about all the time because if you want to produce a, a sort of standardized product, you've got to have standard standardized as wood so so um i went off to kentucky um i think it was from 2015 ish mm -hmm. um or, or possibly um a little bit earlier than that actually um to really make those contacts and uh, get to speak to the people who not just make the barrel but but obviously fill it with their bourbon and so on so um, and these are what we call uh, select casks. So the one behind you, Joe, is yeah. Is so a, should we uh, have a little look yeah. at the bourbon cask uh, as we're talking about it? So um, as David mentioned, he was he was heading to Kentucky to um, source and build relationships with uh, with the guys who 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 make and uh, fill these with with fantastic bourbon. That's right. And um, you know, I think I think the important thing is that there are a lot of bourbon distilleries out there, but we we decided to go with. Um, one of the largest producers, actually. So it's part mm -hmm. of the Brown Foreman Group, who are responsible for Jack Daniels, um, Woodford Reserve, uh, and Old Forester. And we decided we'd go down the route of Old Forester predominantly. Um, it's quite a small distillery. So um, it was important to us that we chose something that actually was a great bourbon. So, you know, we've got a bottle or two upstairs, and uh, I think we all agree it's a really, really good bourbon. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so... That was the starting place, really, for for selecting these sorts of casks. Um, and then it's getting continuity and consistency. So I don't know how many loads we've had now, but uh, we must be on our... We've had a lot. I don't know. We're on our sort of ninth, 10th, 11th loads, something like yeah. that, and 250 at a time, possibly more than. It is. It is um, yeah. It is a busy, busy day when you get cast delivered. Um, so yeah, yeah, My big, fingers have got the yeah, titles exactly, as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not the kind of thing we tend to do in white shirts. 
Um, <laughs> it's a hands-on day. Um, but yeah, that that the, the, uh, the relationships and uh, the contacts that David built in, the, in that trip, um, really, really important because that delivery of bourbon cast that we receive is bang on. Yeah, um, and it wasn't the first guy I met either, which is you know important, I think. I, I mean, I went mm -hmm. to Canada as well. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, I think it's, it is that personal side again. You've got to meet the maker. You've got to meet the guy who sells them to you. And um, I think that's so important uh, that you do that. And Jim was, was, was great and instrumental in making those initial sort of introductions. So mm -hmm. we followed through on those. Um, so when you typically meet up with a, with a bourbon producer in Kentucky, an old kind of whiskey making country out there, um, I don't imagine that's the kind of, a kind of, a kind of, kind of meeting where you sit down for a, a low or no alcohol beer. <laughs> uh, no, it was interesting. And in fact, you know, um, I, they decided it would take me out um, and we'd have a meal and would you like a drink, David? And I said, yeah, yeah. And expecting the wine list to, to be thrown at me. Um, no, it was a bourbon list. So, you know, we had to have a, a sort of a, a pre-meal bourbon. We had to have a, a bourbon to go to the first and second course and they're all different <laughs> ones, you know. So by the time we'd finished, we, we, we were quite bourboned out really. But, um, but they drink it like that over there, and, and, and it's not volume. It's just the different flavors and textures that, that, that you can get in a bourbon, a bourbon whiskey. And, um, you know, we really enjoy, I really enjoyed the whole process of understanding how they make bourbon, and, and that really is important for our process, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was an interesting trip. Um, I think I was out there for about two weeks. Yeah. Um, and probably due another visit, actually. Yeah, definitely due another <laughs> visit. A little bit difficult over the last couple of years, yeah. fair to say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's like so many things, isn't it? You know, relationships are yeah. so important. Yeah. Um, you, we've, we, we put so much faith in these, in these casks. You've got to make sure that they're right. One of the little telltale signs as well, when you look at a cat of bourbon cask, it's got um, B on the actual studs. You, I don't know if you can see this, uh, Jonathan, if you get really close, there's that. It's probably upside down B, looks like an eight. Um, but effectively, that, that, that stands for bluegrass. And um, th there's a selection of distilleries who fit into this sort of, um, this sort of size, if you like. And uh, um, that old forester is one. So um, if you're ever trying to uh, identify a particular um, group of distilleries and look at the studs, um, that's quite it's an quite interesting nice little, little telltale signs as well. You know, yeah. we can flip them over on deliveries as well, obviously, before we paint it. And you see the Cooper's marks and... And that kind of thing. It's um, it's a real art form making casks. Yeah, and this is somebody's baby. You know, that they do. Uh, you can tell the different um, coopers uh, by the the, t the type and style of cask. Um, so they all have little little ways of making them. But fundamentally, there's no glue in these. You know, they're held together by these bands, and that's it. Um, mm -hmm. There's nothing in there at all. There might be a little bit of beeswax uh, around around to seal the the lids, but but there's no glue. There's no glue allowed actually um, in in a cask. So, um, yeah, it's a very skillful thing. And, and probably we can talk about how yeah, I think now we move, yeah, uh, move I think to this stage. Worth, uh, so actually, as Jonathan's looking at that, so this is a hoop driver, you know, so you can see here, you know, where this hoop will have, have moved. Um, and, you know, so if we're, we're you know, we're taking uh, a delivery of casks in the summer, you know, and we take those 212 casks out of that container on a hot, kind of uh, hot week, and we put them at the back of the distillery, and we're drawing on that those casks each week and so when we bring them in we often need to tighten them up um, this hoop driver has seen a lot of action now um, but you know you're tightening the hoops before we fill um, so you can see here where these bands have been tightened before we put the cask up um, and yeah. the, type, the type of oak as well is really important so these are all made from um, Quercus alba which is uh, American white oak and it's quite a tight um, uh, grained wood which is really important. Obviously, you can imagine if there's lots of um, sort of uh, pores and holes in your wood, then you're going to lose a lot of liquid. And that's very, very different to European oak, where yes. that's much more open, um, much harder to make casks from. And nowadays, hard to find, to mm. be fair. There's not a lot of European oak left. And I think that's uh, Quercus rubber. That's correct. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And there's other things going on as well in the industry. Uh, around wood types, but fundamentally, this is the absolute backstop of the industry is, is uh, the oak cask. It really is, and there is a reason it's oak, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, I've got a quick question for you, okay. David, which has come through over the earpiece. 
And uh, we've had a question um, about how many times we reuse a cask or how many times okay. can you reuse a cask, which is a great question. It, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, when you do reuse, I mean, obviously we're using them again anyway. So we call mm -hmm. them first fill, but they've actually had bourbon in them. So that's, that's twice, but we've used them once. So um, Maybe, yeah, typically um, <laughs> we're going to get quite a lot of wood activity in that first fill. So it's, it's going to do a really good job fairly quickly um and the the character of, of that is relatively oaky you know you can get a bit of oak out of that um the second fill is so important as well because it gives us a different sort of product to start to use in our bottlings um so you know we could easily have seen 10 years first fill second fill could be another 10 years it could probably another 15 years actually because it's going to not be as active in the second fill and then there is third fill i mean you're losing all the time this activity so uh the, the latter fills if you like need more time to actually get the character of that wood back out um i can't see us doing a great deal of third fill but the second fill is in hugely important definitely um it's it's it, it depends so largely on you know, how many how many times you refill a cask depends largely as well on what you want to make um and you know as david says that second fill is really important you know so um, we're introducing more second fill into the warehouse, as you might expect, as we're emptying casks. And when you're emptying casks at three and a half, four, four and a half years old, you know, they've still got a lot of life in them. And, uh, and you know, I can see refills doing great things. You know, we might even be putting that in a bottle, Dave. Um, yeah. Hopefully in your lifetime. We'll, I hope uh, so. Yeah. You know, we'll see, yeah. some, we'll see some, uh, some really beautiful <clears throat> old uh, Yorkshire whiskey yeah. uh, from these refill casks. Um, so yeah. you can get a lot of life out of them. Um, I think the days are definitely gone where you would see distilleries kind of um, in filling less active casks. I think most people, yeah. most most whiskey makers now are, 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 are really big on oak and uh, their wood policies are much tighter than they were, say, in the 80s or the 90s. So you're seeing um, kind of a lot more quality casks, which therefore means your refills are better quality and that uh, uh, resulting whiskey is better as well. Yeah, and I think going back, you know, not many years actually bourbon casks were just a byproduct of of, of the industry and uh, yes, the scots yeah. would would bring those in practically just paying for the transport you know the, mm -hmm. the cask didn't cost them anything because the, the bourbon guys just wanted them out of the way mm -hmm. but obviously now that's moved on i mean there was a, when we first started um there was a problem with supply um and that was due to the fact that uh, maybe the, the uh, virgin oak uh, harvest was, was was particularly poor um in successive years so it started to dry up and uh, i can remember it being quite difficult to get people to talk to us first of all and second of all to actually sell us the casks um because they knew they were in a very strong position you know yeah. um supply was outstripping Good. Uh, sorry the other way around supply was uh, was uh, also demand was outstripping supply so it's quite a difficult period yeah yeah i think you know and there's, with more distilleries being built it's a big it's a big part of it, isn't it? Yeah, um, we're gonna yeah. See. But that's not the only cask. It's not. It's really not, um, which is a perfect time for a whiskey break. Excellent. Um, <laughs> so we're going to uh, uh, sip away on Yorkshire Day 2021. If you have just joined us on this session, this is our open uh, weekend, open day bottling. And it is one of only 1,500 bottles and uh, a combination of full-term sherry-matured whiskey and full-term bourbon-matured whiskey. Um, and yeah, it's all about uh, kind of celebrating this weekend, you know, which historically we would do a physical big open day and here we are in a virtual form this year. Um, so let's just have a little quick taste of that, Dave. So mm. we've, uh, we've explored bourbon casks. If you've tasted our flagship whiskey matured in bourbon and um, bourbon characteristics from, uh, or, or bourbon cask characteristics, are you looking at honey? Uh, vanilla, citrus, toffee, and some really lovely lighter fruit and oats. Whereas with this, um, a completely different thing altogether. So you're next to um, one of these magnificent casks. Yeah, it's um, from Spain, which it would be. <laughs> right. be, be bean sherry. Um, but yeah, it's uh, another side to, to our wood policy is um, some full term um, sherry casks. And again, is building that relationship again um, with the suppliers. Um, so the, the, these uh, guys were, again, another Jim Swan introduction. 
um, and they make some absolutely brilliant uh, casts. Not just that, but they season them as well. So they're actually mm -hmm. making the sherry that goes into them. So uh, again, it's a full full story down near Seville. Um, so yeah, uh, Miguel uh, was was a fantastic guy. Uh, we spent a couple of days in his company, Beck and I, and had a great a great time sort of selecting the cast that would. Uh, we would fill at the same time as the bourbons, actually. So, I mean, that's probably on its second fill now. Um, that one actually isn't. It's not filled yet. Not, no, so no. It's, that's it's, the first dump, so that'll be, yeah. what, nearly five it's, uh, years it's, or four and a half years old? It's it's one of the early ones. Yeah. So you you and, you and Tom were filling that um, before I was here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I believe. And so, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a cracking big old sherry, but... Um, Oloroso, yeah? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, LOL. You got it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful cask, and um, you know that's that's one of the types of sherry casks that we uh, we get from Miguel in Spain. Um, the one other size that we've got here, which is a sherry hogshead. Um, so the Oloroso cask there, very much the kind of uh, dried, rich, fruity character that you're getting if you're tasting this whiskey with us. Um, whereas this kind of style. A pheno cask, which we did a single cask back in um, back in February, March time, which some of you may have tasted, and uh, again, it's a completely different flavor profile to this. So, um, we've got casks from Kentucky and uh, obviously held bourbon, and with those, we're we're looking for that kind of nice, consistent character and and continuity in supply. Whereas with this and uh, with our sherry casks, we're looking at more kind of variation and, and character. different mm -hmm. different characteristics and lots of different flavors and different things that we can do with them. Um, fair to say that you had a good run at Sherry while you were out there, Dave? <laughs> yeah, very much so, yeah. yeah. I'm trying to pour it into a glass with one of those, I don't know what they call them, actually. It's Dip a magnificent in. display, isn't yeah. it? Of, of, of missing of... my glass by miles. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah it, it's, it's fantastic. And um, the size of the cask uh, is really important to how quickly it matures as well. So this boy will take longer because your service area per litre is, is not as mm -hmm. big as the baby over there and that, yeah. that would just go off like a rocket and um, mm -hmm. that's why a lot of new distilleries tend to go small casks mm -hmm. the problem with that is it gets very very woody very very quick so uh, you know taking again advice from Jim if you want a woody oaky whiskey use a lot of small casks yeah yeah so yeah. so these are much better if you've got the time to wait these will do a better more mellowing job this is a I mean with it quite seriously with exception to the tiny 20 liter cask that we've got here for display purposes, uh, the minimum cask size that we fill is the 200 litre bourbon. So it's kind of 200 litres and up. And uh, yeah, this is all about being able to uh, lay down whiskey long term. Um, we've actually got some samples here just so you can see the journey if you want to take that, Dave. Yeah. So that's what we put in. So that's some new make spirit. So that's what our, our, our colour is like at the start of maturation. Mm -hmm. There you've got some bourbon uh, matured spirit there, not quite three years old. So that is a, a young cask sample from a bourbon barrel. And right there, that lovely sample um, that Dave's holding in his left hand is uh, from a ex-red wine cask, which yeah. is one of our lovely uh, shaved, toasted, and recharred red wine casks that we're using for our STR finish. Um, and we've used for one or two other bottlings, particularly in the distillery projects range before we launched whiskey. Yeah. Um, so you can see a big difference in color there being driven by the... Um, by the different cast types. So, so yeah, interesting enough, that last one is, is a different beast altogether because we're not actually just straight filling a red wine cask. Um, it's actually been uh, rejuvenated. And, and if, if you sort of take two or three millimeters out of the inside and shave uh, the, the cask, you're going to expose the new oak. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you're going to rechar it, so literally burn it um, and uh, uh, roast it or toast it, then we're going to end up with something called an STR which is uh, effectively a rejuvenated red wine cask. It's a great, uh, amazing process, which was largely uh, pioneered, if not entirely pioneered by Jim Swan. That's right. And, the, you know, this type of cask is, yeah, it's a, it's a reconditioning of that wine cask for to optimizing it really for whiskey maturation. That's um, right. So it's a, it's a really amazing process where, um, you know, the Coopers have taken extra steps. It's a lot of extra work. You know, these casks are, uh, each one of them has its own story to tell and its own 
um, you know, the pairs of hands that have touched it in that lifetime, you know, the STR is, is certainly seeing more work and more conditioning than perhaps other cast types. So it's a really special type of cast. Uh, and we've had really brilliant results with it, as we have with all the casts off McGill, yeah. actually, and indeed off the cast, the bourbon cast that we filled, um, which is largely testament to that work that you were doing in those visits, um, which might not have felt like a lot of hard work <laughs> at the time, but it was very, very important in terms of um, securing these casts yeah. for us. On a I mean, I did basis. feel a responsibility because, I mean, it was massive. It's if, massive. If you get that bit wrong, huge bit of work. nothing's going to get right, you know, <laughs> so somebody had to do it. And it was they amazing. did, yeah, no, and it, you know, and, and we're all the better for it. Um, so a quick summary, I suppose, just in cast types here. So if we're looking at bourbon cast maturation, we're looking at lighter flavor profiles, and we're looking at like whiskey from uh, our flagship release, which is lovely light, um, citrusy and honey and vanilla and toffee, whereas with big, rich sherry casks that have held sherries like Oloroso, we're looking like dried, rich fruit and spicy flavors and all those lovely kind of rich Christmas cakey flavors, which you'll be tasting in a bottle of Yorkshire Day 21. Um, and then you've got lots of other types of sherry, um, which we won't be going into right now because we're actually <laughs> at the end of this session. Yeah. Um, but hopefully that's a bit of insight into how we got our casks, what they do for us in terms of flavor. Um, and hopefully, yeah, if you get a chance to open a bottle yeah. of Yorkshire Day 2021, you can see that beautiful sherry cask um, style in action. So, yeah, thank you very much for tuning yeah. in. And cheers, Dave. You're going to be joining Dave in the next session as well. I'm going to have a breather. I'm going to sit down, have a whiskey. Um, thank you very much for tuning in. Cheers.